All right. Well, you're getting for a treat this morning. I'm telling you, we got Reverend uh, Joseph Moore in the house. So if y'all get on your feet as he comes this morning, this is, uh, come on. Praise God. Um, oh, amen, amen, this amen. This man uh, came in contact with him for, through my in-laws, and, uh, which are Pastor Kevin and Susan, and this man just teaching uh, on the end times. Uh, and just a, a re- he's a regular guy. I don't mean that as just normal. Yeah. A normal guy that that, right. that serves a, serves an, a, a God that does the impossible. So yes. anyway, welcome him. Yes. And uh, thank, thank you, for you buddy. Coming. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. No, no, no. Thank you. You can be seated. Great to see you, man. I'm just blessed to be with you. I, I, being here a year and a half ago or a couple years ago, I'm just blown away how cool you guys do everything. It's just righteous how it's proper and normal. And I, I told my wife, I said, uh, she's going to try to come tomorrow. But I told her, I said, you have to meet Pastor Nate and Evan. said, they're so normal. And normal is so fun. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isn't it cool? You can have anybody come and they're going to find out about Jesus. They're going to find out what Jesus did when he was raised from the dead. We have this wild inheritance that we've found out over the years that he left us so much stuff. We're redeemed from the curse of the law. We have peace of mind. We, anything you might have need of, there's nothing that we have that he didn't take care of 2,000 years ago. That's the amazing thing is he, he took care of it all. So we, we come to church to hear the word to find out what he left us. He left us a, a massive inheritance. So uh, you, you might be able to sleep at night. The Bible says he gives his beloved sleep. Hallelujah. Isn't it cool uh, uh, or amazing to be right, living right before the coming of the Lord and how God's raised up all these churches? I mean, look at your building. Look at your place here. I know you. every little detail just, just ministers to you. It preaches to you before you come in to hear the word, doesn't it? Hallelujah. Amen. It communicates to you how, how amazing he is. So what a time to be on the planet. You know, just uh, event after event after event keeps happening that point to the coming of the Lord. And uh, it's interesting that people have taught over the years you can't tell when the Lord's coming back. Yet there's more verses showing us how close we are. Why would the Lord go to so much trouble to use verse after verse after verse? Why? He wants you to have a heads up. He wants you excited. He, he loves you so much. He wants you to, to know how close it is to his return. Now, I hear people say, well, you can't tell when the Lord's coming back. Well, actually, once you get into it, you see all the signs. You can tell exactly when he's coming. Last night, I was driving over from Tulsa. Uh, the signs told me how long it was to get to I-40. Then after that, I started looking for other signs uh, to get from I-40 to Fort Smith. So it didn't freak me out. I, I saw how the mileage told me I was getting closer. So today, we'll look at some stuff that show us flawlessly and precisely how close we are. Because the tendency has been over the years where you can't tell when the Lord's coming back. That'd be like saying, well, I don't know when I'm going to get back to Tulsa when I get on the freeway. Because there are signs that tell me how close I am to Tulsa. So, now what would all that be for? Just to get you excited, to get you expectant. It'd be like when Colleen and I were getting married. I would have hated, we were, Colleen and I were getting ready to get married. And she comes walking down the aisle. Could you imagine? She goes, oh my God, I'm going to marry that guy right there. No. I, could, you, could you imagine her going, another one bites the dust? No. <laughs> no. No, you'd want her excited. You'd want her expectant. To, uh, to be walking down that aisle. And there's some protocol for the church to be so excited and expectant because we're about to see him. We'll look at some verses today that show us we're about to see him. And the amazing thing about it is flawless. It's, it's precise. There's no wiggle room. It's like, really, can we tell them that's how close it is? Yes, we can tell how close it is. Hallelujah. So we're so blessed. And I know uh, God is, there's a, a season right now of a renewal of assignments. Every service you come into, Lord's in, impressing things in your spirit like, okay, Lord, you told me that over the years, and now's the time to rekindle all those graces. He has something for every person in this room to do. Hallelujah. I know the number one thing I think about when I look out about your church is uh, you need more room. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so it wouldn't surprise me to kick the walls out and have a helicopter pad and Pastor Nate will come swinging in on a pole or something. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it takes, right? Jesus is coming soon. So uh, just put, put, pull out all the stops. Praise the Lord. So uh, I love that you're hungry. And uh, aren't you hungry for him? Don't you love him? He gave his life for us. We're in awe that he was beaten for us. So let's get into some verses today that show us how close we are. Now, what's the whole number one purpose so that you accelerate? You see the finish line. You don't run slower. You run faster. I've never been in a race and somebody go, you know, I've been training all this time and there's a finish line. I think I'll chill. No, it's a whole different mentality when you see the finish line. Same thing with the football game. You know, the two-minute warning, uh, uh, the, the intensity changes. 
The plays are more crucial. You can drop the ball at the beginning of the game, but at the very end, you need to, need to be in position, and you need to have a different mentality, and that is uh, hustling and, and looking to score in a shorter period of time. So we'll get into things that show us how close we are, and it gives us renewed fuel, gives us renewed grace to run our race. It's not an escape theology. It's a hustle theology. As you see the countdown, doesn't it freak you out when you're watching a game and you want the quarterback to hurry up and snap the ball because you're watching that clock tick down. You're like, come on, come on, come on, snap the ball. I believe heaven's saying that to the church. Come on, come on, come on, do the will of God. This is it. So we're very, very close. So let's pray and we'll get right into the word. Lord, we love you today. We're amazed that you let yourself be beaten. We're in awe of your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy. Lord, help us comprehend this morning how kind you are, how merciful you are, and how good you are. That you would be lifted up in this room, Jesus. You'd be, we'd see you high and lifted up with your train filling the temple. We're in awe that you're about to come back to the planet. So uh, look what you have done over the years to, to, to get us prepared to see you face to face. We thank you for, for harvest. Thank you for souls being swept into the kingdom. We thank you for the assignment that you've given beyond church. Lord, we thank you for uh, a great grace upon this church. Amplify their voice in this region. We thank you for that. We give you glory. We give you honor and praise. We, we bless you today, Jesus. Thank you for dying for us. In Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said amen. amen. Grab your Bibles there and turn, if you would, to 2 Peter. And we'll go through a few verses and get through a few things. And then we'll get to some signs. And once we get to the signs, it gets clearer and clearer how close we are. Uh, because we're, we're so close to seeing him. I mean, we're going to get into some stuff that happened uh, literally last week. One of the things that happened last week, when we get, once we get into all the signs, uh, uh, the ritual baths near the Temple Mount have not had water in them for 2,000 years. They filled up this last week, first time in 2,000 years. So we're going to look at things where foxes showed up on the Temple Mount a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And uh, it's amazing. The Bible says when you see foxes on the Temple Mount, it's desolate. You know it's time for the Messiah to come back. You, you, uh, Ezekiel prophesied there'd be fish in the Dead Sea. Guess when the fish showed up in the Dead Sea? Last year. So we have event after event after event that God said you'd see right before the Lord comes. So once you add them all up, you're like, wow, the Lord's about to come back. <laughs> so what that tells us is we've got a lot to do in a short period of time, so we, we're engaged. Like when Colleen and I got engaged, we talked more, not less. So the church has to get engaged like, okay, this is it. The amazing thing is, is he, he chose you to be here right before his return. How cool is that? So grab your Bibles and turn there to 2 Peter, if you would, chapter 3. And look at verse 1. We'll go through some verses for a moment. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 3 of 2 Peter. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in which I both stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Notice he calls you his beloved here. Uh, the tone changes from the Gospels to the epistles. You can't get your end time doctrine from the Gospels because he's talking mainly to Jewish boys. Like he said, of that day and that hour, no man knows. Well, he's talking to the church there. He was talking to Jewish boys. Talking to the church, he said, you're not in darkness that that day would overtake you as a thief. And once we get into it, maybe we'll get into it tonight, he was basically telling them exactly when he was coming back, when he told them that as well. It was kind of a little hidden, hidden thought pattern to, to how close it was to his return. So let's read a little bit more and look at the tone here. He says that you'd be mindful of the words that were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles and Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, they'll come in the last days, scoffers walking after their own lusts. And they'll be saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So he gives you the climate. People are going to be scoffing, going, ah, we've heard that. And that's kind of coming to the church, you know. We, well, we've been heard the Lord's coming all of our life. The reason why you've heard that is because he's coming. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> so he says here in the next verse, uh, in verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Well, he said here, change came when... When no one believed a change was coming. In other words, the flood came when, when, when no one believed Noah was preaching. So in other words, alteration or change came uh, when no one believed it. They even had a timepiece. They had Methuselah. Methuselah's name meant when I die, you all die. How would you like to have a name like that? When I'm toast, you're toast. <laughs> I would have been checking up on Methuselah. How's your food? How, you have a cold? <laughs> you all right, buddy? Because you know what happened? The very year Methuselah died, what happened? The flood came. So he was a walking timepiece for them. They could look at him. And I bet it freaked him out when he got so old. Uh, when he was up, he, the oldest living man ever, God held off judgment as long as he could. I believe it was 969 years. I bet when he was 950, I'd have gone, you know, you're getting kind of up there. <laughs> Something's coming. So, so they could tell by how old he was getting that something's coming. So change came. 
It's pretty amazing that change is about to come. And it's sad that Hollywood has more of a feel of it than the church. You got movies, The Walking Dead. You got movies about uh, zombies. Because, see, they sense the change coming but don't know how to interpret it. We know what the change is. Jesus is coming back. Now, we know the rapture of the church is signless. But the second coming has like 50 exact signs. I mean, they're precise. So uh, we know that we can back up for us. It's like seven or eight years even before the second coming. We're going to be raptured. The church is going to be evacuated. We, we, some people don't like that. But you know what? Enoch was raptured, handed off to Noah. Elijah was raptured, handed off to Elisha. The church is going to be raptured. Actually, Jesus handed off to the church and he was raptured. The church is going to hand off to the Jews and God's going to repay them seven years of old covenant time. So you're watching the setup for that. Just what you preached on God bringing them back to their land and reviving them. That's happened in our lifetime. So we're privileged to, to watch God's word come to pass right in front of our eyes. So we get into all this because it, it brings precision. All the prophecies about the first coming of the Lord are so amazing. I was witnessing to a Navy SEAL one time, and I was telling him about when Jesus came the first time, all the odds of those prophecies, you know, born in Bethlehem of a tribe of Judah, entered into Jerusalem on a colt, preceded by a messenger, they gambled over his robe, wore a crown of thorns, they prophesied that he would not open his mouth, prophesied that it would get dark in the middle of the day while he was on the cross. This is what this Navy SEAL said to me. He goes, well, they read those prophecies and brought them to pass. I said, an eclipse while Jesus is on the cross? How do you pull that off? So, <laughs> so you can hear all the flawlessness of all the signs and still not believe. But you know what the odds are of all those happening in one generation? 780 trillion times a billion times another trillion. It's 780 with 33 zeros afterwards. Even in science, it's, it's absurd to think that it happened by chance. And that's amazing, those prophecies. But you know what? For every one verse there is about the first coming of the Lord, there's eight times more about the second coming. So if he was that flawless about the first coming, we're going to look at some stuff that shows us how close we are to the second coming of the Lord. I think of this church right here. I grew up in Louisiana, and I remember hearing Kenneth Hagin in 1970, 50 years ago, and how God brought people out of all these different denominations uh, so we could find out more about the truth and how we're hungry this morning. So God set your life up for this. This is not an accident. Somewhere someone prayed for all of us, and we got hungry, and we started hearing the word, and nothing satisfies you after that. When you find out the truth of the word, you're like, man, you're like a, like a bulldog. Give me more word. Come on. Don't hold back on me. I want to find out what Jesus did for me. So we're very, 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 very privileged to be living when all this revelations come into the church and we're blessed. So let's look at one more thing that even helps us. Go over to Isaiah. Grab your Bibles there and turn back to Isaiah and look at Isaiah 46. I believe it's page uh, 819 if you've got a Bible like mine. It will be cool when we all have the same Bible, won't it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's look at one more thing that shows us about end time prophecy and how, how blessed we are. Uh, look at Isaiah 46. Buzz down to verse 9 there. He says in Isaiah 46 verse 9, Remember the former things of old, I'm God. There's none yes, I'm God. There's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Basically, this is pretty cool. He goes, This is how you can tell I'm God. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens. And it brings authenticity to the book. That's a pretty cool deal where, you know, anybody else, you can talk to them. You can talk to a Buddhist. You can talk to a Muslim. Their book doesn't give you future. This is the only book that gives you future. God prophesied. Ezekiel prophesied the year they'd be reestablished as a nation. Happening exactly to the year. Gabriel told Daniel the year Jesus would come the first time. Came exactly to the year. So the precision of it's amazing. Listen to the first 10 names of guys in the Bible. This will bless you. He's going to give you the entire plan of God through the first 10 names of guys in the Bible. Listen to this. I know it's a lot, but run with me mentally for a second, okay? Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enos means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahiliel means the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch means teaching. Methuselah means his death brings. We talked about that. Lamech means despairing. And Noah means rest. Put them all together. Listen to this. Man is appointed mortal with sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching that his death brings the despairing rest. Gives you the entire plan of redemption with the first ten names of guys in the Bible. 
Because God said, this is how you can tell I'm God. I'm going to tell you the future before you get there. So we're living in this little sliver of time when all these verses are coming to pass. Israel made a nation, Jerusalem went back. All these things were like, oh my Lord. Lord, you said this. And this is what he said to, to them in the Gospels. When you see these things, lift up your heads. That you could be living and you're downtrodden and sad. The whole purpose about it, so you're excited. Just like Colleen walking down the aisle. I couldn't imagine. Here we go. She's coming down the aisle getting ready, to, getting ready for us to get hitched. And she's like, oh my God, where's my, where's my needles? I need to shoot up a little more. No, I'd want her excited. I'd want her happy. Could you imagine her being supernaturally depressed the day we get married? No, no, you want her excited. He actually is telling us all these things we'll get into so that you're happy and hopeful. If you hear end time preaching and it scares you, it's not Bible. It's not Bible. I, I watch guys on TV pull verses out of context that are, don't even apply to the church and it scares the church. Like the ten virgins, if you don't have oil in your lamp, you're not going up. He's not talking to the church there, he's talking to the world. I don't need oil in my lamp, I've got the maker of the oil. Why would I want oil when I've got the real? So it's amazing how we try to put that on the church and you feel like you don't qualify. Because in the Gospels... You don't qualify. He hadn't been raised from the dead. Once he's raised from the dead, you're him. As he is, so are we in this world. So I'm not trying to get God's favor. I have his favor. I'm not trying to get righteous. I am righteous. I'm not trying to get healed. I am healed. I'm not trying to get saved. I am saved. So the tone changes once you get into the epistles, and that's where we are. But let's go back. Grab your Bibles there, and let's go back to Luke, and let's buzz through some signs that show us how close we are. Because, man, once we get into all these things, it's one after another, and it shows us blatantly how close we are to seeing the King. Isn't it wonderful? We sing these songs. Uh, there's amazing how, how good they are to sing about Him, but all of a sudden we're going to see Him face to face. Man, the protocol. <laughs> Of all of a sudden being caught up and all of a sudden we're at the throne of God. And we see Jesus, eyes as a flame of fire, feet like undefined brass, voice of many waters. And the cool thing about him is he's all goodness. Everything about him is kindness, goodness, and mercy. He loves you so much. He wants you excited. He wants you expectant. I mean, the Lord hammers me on that. He goes, well, you can get into all the stuff that shows you, shows you how close you are. But the whole purpose is it, I want him to know how much I love him. He's not mad at you this morning. He loves you. He wants to encourage you. wants to lift you up. Every time you hang out with Jesus, it picks you up and lifts you up. Everything about him quickens you. There's not one thing about him that goes, well, you're a loser. No, you're not a loser. He redeemed you. Come on. Yeah. So grab your Bibles there and go to Luke. Buzz over to Luke chapter 21. Verses that you know real well, but Jesus is going to be super specific about a couple of things about Jerusalem and about Israel that show us where we are in time. So look at Luke 21. Look at verse 24. They'll fall by the edge of the sword, and they'll be led away captive unto all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down to the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, that's pretty crazy. The, uh, how precise is that? The Lord goes, hey, when you see Jerusalem on back, time's up. Remember, everything revolves around Jerusalem. The Bible said Jerusalem would be a cup of trembling for all nations. Remember, if you live west of Jerusalem, you read left to right. If you live east of Jerusalem, you read right to left. Everything goes back to that piece of real estate. So in 1967, the Six-Day War, the Jews got Jerusalem back. They probably were freaking out like, this is it, man. Because Jesus said, when you see that happen, time's up. Now, you, you, we have to look at this because it's so easy to get. The miracles that happened in the Six-Day War, you can Google them. It's called Against All Odds. And the guys I'm talking about for a couple of minutes, they interviewed them, and this is what they said. We don't even believe in this stuff, but something happened. So they don't believe even afterwards. We believe before we see. Am I in the right room? Come on. You remember all the stories. There's so many of them. I'll give you one of them, but there's like, there's like 50 of them. One of the ones was the Egyptian army was coming down against Israel there in that six-day war. Israel's completely surrounded, just like Israel's completely surrounded today. Pretty amazing. So Israel's surrounded. The Egyptian army's coming down on Jerusalem. 88 tanks coming down toward Israel. One Israeli cook didn't even know how to fire a tank. He said, you know what? If I'm going to die, I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. So he hops in the tank, figures out how to shoot the shells. Can you imagine jumping into a tank and go, go, go ahead and start firing shells at the army? He's a cook. He goes, I don't know how to do this. So he figures out how to load the turret up and move the turret and all that. Next thing you know, he's firing shells. 88 tanks, Egyptian tanks, against one Israeli tank. He's firing shells, firing shells, firing shells. The Egyptian commander comes out in the morning with a white flag. He said, I'm here to surrender to the highest ranking officer. 
The Israeli goes, highest ranking officer is just me. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the Egyptian commander goes, oh, no, it's not just you. The whole night the countryside was filled with tanks, with men dressed in white. You've been shelling us all night, and we can't take it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's called a miracle. Yeah. So, so Jerusalem's won back. I mean, there's story after story after story of divine intervention because time is up. So watch Jesus get even clearer to show us where we are in time. Skip down to verse 29. He's going to get even clearer. So look what he says here in verse 29. He said, look at the fig tree. That's the nation of Israel. All the trees. That's the prophetic nations around Israel. He said, when they now shoot forth their bud, you see and know of your own selves that summer our harvest is nigh at hand. He goes, likewise. Boy, I like that word likewise. Watch what he says. Likewise, when you see these things come to pass, what's he talking about? When you see Jerusalem on back, when you see Israel made a nation, the fig tree budding. When you see these things come to pass, no. When you see these things come to pass, no. He's telling us these things so that you can know how close it is. He said, when you see these things, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Are you ready for the next verse? This is pretty radical. Look at the next verse. He says in verse 32, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all is fulfilled. What's he saying here? The group that sees Israel made a nation and Jerusalem went back, that group of people won't pass away till all is fulfilled. That's crazy. I hear people go, I don't believe that. It don't matter. <laughs> uh, you know, people will go, well, I don't really believe that. Well, whatever. See how that works for you, sport. But you know what? Uh, <laughs> After you get through so many signs, it's like, oh my God, Jesus is about to come back. So the Lord's saying, I'm writing this to you or telling you this so that you can know how close you are. Why, why would the Lord go, I'm going to tell you how close you are, but you can't tell when I'm coming? No, that's psychotic. He gave verse after verse after verse after verse to show us where we are. Why? So you can make changes. You accelerate. Just like on a two-minute warning. Could you imagine coming back to the huddle in the Super Bowl and the quarterback goes, I need you to go deep. And you go, I'm a little tired. Could you imagine telling the quarterback that in the Super Bowl? No, it wouldn't matter if your leg was about to fall off. You'd go, throw me the ball. Yeah. In other words, your mind gets off how tired you are. Your mind gets off how sore you are. We've got a couple minutes left, a couple seconds left. We've got to do something. So the intensity changes to the point you don't care how you feel. This generation, well, I don't feel like that. doesn't matter how you feel. Jesus is about to come back. And you know how kind of him to go likewise. In other words, just as <laughs> clear it is when in the spring you see the fig tree buds. In Tulsa and here, in the wintertime, man, it goes brown. The grass goes brown. The trees fall. The leaves fall. Could you imagine in spring the trees start getting their buds, you know, and the grass starts turning? And somebody goes, hey, summer's not coming this year. You go, what? No, the trees are preaching to me. The grass is preaching to me. There's a temperature change. Just as the grass does... And the trees do. He said, likewise, when you see Israel, the same manner, when you see Israel made a nation of Jerusalem on back, just as bold as you are about the temperature change, when you see this happen, there's a kingdom change coming. And you can't get any more blatant than that. But he gave us two signs. Israel made a nation of Jerusalem on back. We got about 50. I, mean, I told you just a while ago, two or three of the ones that happened in the last, last week, the, 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 the areas for ritual baths around the temple began to fill with water and became full for the first time in 2,000 years. The rabbis were freaking out. Then there were foxes on the temple mount. I talked about that a while ago. Uh, the Bible says in Lamentations, when you see that, the Messiah is about to come back. So you got water filling up. you got, <laughs> you got foxes showing up on the temple mount. you got fish showing up in the Dead Sea. you got Israel regathered. you got Jerusalem one back. Let's go through them, though. I mean, how wonderful is that the Lord told us what it would look like and in front of our eyes we're watching it come to pass. Pretty crazy. Now, I like this. <laughs> Jesus said you could see this and you could know this. Interesting. Wasn't that sweet of him to go? He didn't go, you're going to be so clueless that you'll have no idea when I'm coming. No. He said, I'll make it so obvious you could see it and you could know it. Now, Brother Hagin used to prophesy about a spirit or an attitude of seeing and knowing on the church in the last days. Where'd that come from? That verse right there. Let's talk about this for a second. Hang with me. We're going we're gonna to go through all these signs. They're so cool. But... Uh, Think of 1917. There's a movie out right now about 1917. It was a big year for the earth. World War I. 
really want, the cool thing about 1917 was Allenby, hang with me, an Australian general, flew into Israel, <laughs> and before he came in to deliver Israel their land, they passed out flyers everywhere. Allenby's coming, Allenby's coming, Allenby's coming. Well, they didn't know that in Arabic, Allenby meant a prophet sent from God to deliver you your land. So the Turks read this, and they're like, well, we can't fight against God. Drop their weapons. Israel got their land back right there in 1917. Pretty amazing. Many things happened in 1917. What was called the Balfour Declaration. So England promised Israel their land right there in 1917. Same year, Kenneth Hagin was born. Remember the Lord appearing to his mother <laughs> and said, uh, name him John. She didn't name him John. She goes, I don't like that name. So <laughs> how do you like telling God, uh, yeah, I'm not going to name him John. I'll name him Kenneth. And all the Lord said to her was that Brother Hagin would have a part in getting the earth ready for the second coming. Not everything, but a part. Now, I've preached in Rhema, Australia, Rhema, Norway, Rhema, Italy, Rhema, Germany, Rhema, England, Rhema. Name a country that Brother Hagin's message hasn't affected. With zero fanfare. Sowing the word, sowing the word, sowing the word. <laughs> well, you, you think about it. Hagin, guess what Hagin means in the Hebrew? One to go before to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. Supposed to name him John. There's a lady in Mark Brzee's church a few years ago. She died. She's writing a book about it now. Died and went to heaven. And they defibrillated her and got her back. She's in heaven talking to Jesus. And she saw Brother Hagin. She goes, look, there's Kenneth Hagin. Jesus said, you mean John? <laughs> so if your name's supposed to be something, it's supposed to be that. <laughs> so, so maybe your parents messed up. When you get to heaven, it will be corrected. So... <laughs> But don't you love it? Didn't even face Jesus. You know, like, oh, you mean John? That, that's what his destiny is. So we're living when all this destiny is happening. I mean, 1917, you got that happening. Then you have 1967, you got Jerusalem one back. Isn't it amazing? Look at the mirror or, or the, the, the things with the fig tree and the vine do yielding their strength. 1917, Alamy comes in, Hagen's born. Listen to this. 1948, Israel's made a nation. What happened in the church? Healing revival. Man, for 10 years, uh, people that didn't even know the Bible had miracles. You watch those old videos, A.A. A. Allen's going, look at this man, the devil's all over him. Come out. I mean, they didn't hurt. all they knew was the name of Jesus. You tell them who they are in Christ, they go, what are you talking about? You and I know more, than, so, in, in, know more about re redemption than they did, but, but, but Israel's reestablished what happened in the church. Healing revival. 1967, Jerusalem's went back. What happened in the church? Charismatic renewal. Every person in this room is a part of that charismatic renewal. So you see God doing something physical with Israel and does something spiritual with the church. So you're, you're viewing that right in front of your eyes. So let's go through some of these signs because this is pretty amazing. Jesus goes, hey, look at the fig tree. Look at Jerusalem being won back. The group that sees that, you're it. So what does that mean for us? It just means there's destiny on you. Daniel saw you. Isn't it cool? The Holy Spirit's already talked about what you look like. He saw you. He said, you'd know your God, and that would make you strong, and you would do exploits. So we're, we're a group that knows our God. How do we get to know our God? Through His Word. I'm not moved by my feelings. I'm not moved by what I feel like. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm moved by what the Word says about me. I mean, our group got taught that to the point. I remember my mom, she, before she got a hold of the Word, she was afraid of everything. You ever been around someone like that? My mom would have said, don't put that mic on. It'll, the battery will explode and you'll catch on fire. Mom, come on. You know, you know what I mean? It didn't matter. She put three life jackets on me. We're water skiing. I'd walk out to go water skiing like this. I said, man, I look, I look like the Michelin man. This is not cool. But she was so afraid before she got a hold of the Word. She's afraid of everything. She was afraid for us kids, you know. I said, Mom, three belt life jackets? Well, if one fell off, you still got two. <laughs> okay. If two fell off, you got one. Hello, this is crazy. Well, when she got a hold of the Word, transformation. The Word changed her, that stability, just what Daniel prophesied. I had a wreck on my bicycle. I'd built these ramps. You know how you get crazy when you're younger? And we are building these jumps that were too far. I flew on this one jump, went over the handlebars, cut my face wide open. The cut went all the way up into my nose. I'm bleeding everywhere. My lips are separated, flapping. I walk up into my house. My sister's playing the piano, and she screams, Ah! I walk over to my mom. She goes, she goes Don't bleed on the carpet. We got prayer meeting tonight. She didn't care if I bled, just don't bleed here, people are coming over. It didn't even phase her. Whereas before, she would have passed out right there, boom, she'd hit the floor. The Word got in her, and it produced this strength. See, the Word gets in you, and it's just what Daniel prophesied. You're strong, you know your God, and you do exploits. 
So it's the, the transformation comes from hearing. That's why we go, why are we supposed to hear the word so much? It changes you. The entrance of his word gives light. What is the light that we have? What Jesus left us 2,000 years ago. All right, so let's buzz through these signs. You've got Israel made a nation. You've got Jerusalem one back. What's the next sign on, on the list there? Hebrew language restored. God said right before the coming of the Lord, he'd restore to them a pure language. In our lifetime, uh, 100, 120 years ago, no one spoke Hebrew in Israel. Now they all speak Hebrew in Israel. Wow. The, the thing that God said, what I'll do is I'll reestablish that. And when did he do that? Our lifetime. Pretty amazing. The next one would be the Ethiopian Jews. Okay, this is pretty cool. He said, okay, right for the coming of the Lord, right before the Messiah comes, I'm going to bring them out of Ethiopia. So Israel, in 1992, flew these C-130s right down into Ethiopia and airlifted 18,000 Ethiopian Jews. Because <laughs> God said, this is what you'll see right before the coming of the Lord. How cool. They had these C-130s. The manifest on the plane said 187 passengers. When they landed, they had 192. This is the first time ever that when planes took off, that when they landed, they had more people than when they took off. Ladies were having babies on those airplanes. How cool is that? I mean, what, what do you put on your birth certificate? Uh, Israel, Jordan, Egypt. No, just put airborne. Come on. We don't know... <laughs> How'd you, like, how'd you like to have, I have no idea what country I was born in. So, so God did that. Amazing. That, that he, he did exactly what he said. He got them and brought them out. You can go to Israel and, and look at, there's a section where they, they honor the Ethiopian Jews that were brought back. An American man paid for it, $30 million. He was known for running from the law, being really a drug smuggler. Did one good deed for Israel and our country pardoned him. It's amazing how if we'll do things for Israel, uh, uh, God will do some things for us. So we're blessed. We're so blessed that we're blessing the nation of Israel. So you got the, 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 the language restored. You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. After that, this is pretty cool. You got the revival of the Roman Empire. That's called the EU, the United States of Europe. You know, I flew from Norway down to France. They don't even hit, do your passport. It's just one big nation. The cool thing about this is on their money is the woman from the book of Revelation. I mean, it's pretty crazy. You want to get even crazier, if you look at their capital building, it's in Strasbourg, France, and it's, uh, it's not similar to the Tower of Babel. It's identical to the Tower of Babel. It's that whole system, we'll make our own way to heaven. No, you won't make your own way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So in our lifetime, you've got these tangible events happening. You've got the, the language restored, Ethiopian Jews brought back. You've got fish showing up in the Dead Sea. You've got foxes showing up on the Temple Mount. Pretty crazy. All right, after that, you've got the fertility of the land of Israel. Now, these are just tangible things to look at that, that build a case for how close we are. So you have the, uh, the fertility of the land of Israel. 120 years ago, Mark Twain was in Israel. He said the land is so desolate, it won't support life. Right now, Israel produces 90% of the fruit for all of Europe. Could you imagine right now, this morning, you eat a pear, it says made in New Jersey. Eat a banana, made New Jersey. Eat an apple, made New Jersey. Israel's the size of New Jersey. What if every piece of fruit you ate came from New Jersey? You'd go, man, this is crazy. What's the dirt like in New Jersey? <laughs> How do they till that ground to where it's so good? I've been on the Golan Heights. You can go up on the northern part of Israel. No one has to tell you where the border with Syria is. There's lush green grass, and you look at the, this line, and it's just brown dirt. What's that? That's Syria. Because God said, I'll make the land preach for me. I told my buddy, I said, now, do you use Scott's super turf builder to get this? I said, do you sprinkler this? He goes, no, we don't do anything to it. To get my grass to look like their grass, I got to use Scott's super turf builder, and I got to water it, I got to baby it, got to talk to it. Come on, come on, come on, you can do this. <laughs> I even used Scott's super turf builder last year, and I called Scott's. I said, you know what? Your fertilizer's not working like it used to, because used to, it'd make your grass like a carpet. The lady told me, you're right, we detuned it because of so many lawsuits, we didn't want to have uh, fertilizer that was so strong. I said, well, come on, for me to get my grass to look like Israel's, I got to have the stout stuff from Scott's. I got to water it. I told my buddy, I said, how'd you guys get that? He goes, we don't do anything to it. We don't do anything to it. We don't tend to it. We don't do anything to it. God's word's so powerful. He said, I'll speak to the land. I'll make it so prosperous and so blessed. Pretty amazing. You're tangibly watching God's word make change. All right, that's pretty radical. So you have the, 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 uh, the, the, basically the capital building, the EU. You got the fertility of the land. Israel's the only nation that has more trees since they've been keeping count. 
There's a bunch more about the fertility of the land of Israel. They, they learned how to put a tray underneath their trees, and it catches the dew, and the trees grow up like crazy. So you have tangible, physical things to look at. There's a bunch more. One of my favorites is the Temple Mount Institute. It's a group of Jewish men, last name's Cohen, means priest. They've been going to school for 25 years. What have they been doing? They're learning how to do sacrifices. They're getting ready to do sacrifices. Why? Right after the rapture, it goes back to Old Covenant time, and they'll start having sacrifices again. This last April, they had a sacrifice on the edge of the Temple Mount and didn't get arrested. The year before, they got arrested. Three weeks ago, they went up on the Temple Mount and started praying. First time in years. About three or four weeks ago, they tried, got arrested. Six months ago, they tried, got arrested. Last year, they tried, got arrested. This last week, they didn't get arrested. The police let them do it. So you got all these things uh, pointing to the Temple Mount that shows you how close we are to Jesus coming back. Now, that Temple Mount Institute, they have a menorah. They have all the instruments they need for Old Testament worship. They thought, well, they don't have a red heifer. Man, there's almost 30-some-odd red heifers on the land of Israel now. Used to, when they had one, they'd inspect it and go, okay, is this red heifer going to be okay? And they would inspect it, and it'd be fine. But they don't have one. They got 30-some-odd now. So you, you have everything ready to hand off to them. You have Russia in Crimea, you got Russia in the Ukraine, you got Russian bases all over Syria, because the Bible said Russia's going to attack Israel right after we leave. So Russia's set up, you got birds uh, on the land, you got foxes on the land, you got fish showing up, you got all these different groups showing up. So what's the church do? If God can get all these other groups in position, (laughs) what's he dealing with the church? Now, this other one's pretty radical because it's all the birds. I was watching the Animal Planet channel a few years ago because I'm an ESPN guy. And this Israeli ornithologist goes, hey, it's the largest gathering of predatory birds ever in history. I'm like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Largest gathering of predatory birds ever in history. 172 different species of predatory birds. She goes, we don't understand it. Man, I freaked out. Why? Because the Bible says, after the Ezekiel 38 war, God calls on the fowl of the air, and they come clean the land up. He even talks about their places after the Ezekiel 38 war that are radioactive, that they have to mark, that you're not in the proper suit to go mess with it. Leave it alone. Mark it. Seven years later, God calls on the fowl of the air to come clean the land up, and that's the Battle of Armageddon. So you've got the cleanup crew in Israel right now. Now that should freak us out. Because when, you, when, you, when, when Noah got up on the ark and the, he preached and preached and preached, boy, I'd love to see the intensity of Noah's preaching. I guarantee he didn't go, hey, get in the ark, everything's going to be bad. I, I, I bet Noah was screaming like a madman. Could you imagine Noah? Hey, you might, I don't, hey, sorry to interrupt your life, but you might want to get in. Okay, they didn't get in, but could you imagine when the animals start lining up? I can't hardly get my dog to get in my truck, much less having... Can you imagine herding cats? Could you imagine herding alligators? Could you... I would have seen the animals going, whoa, something's up with this, because that's impossible. So nature got in position. You've got nature getting position right now. So if God can get fish in the Dead Sea, He can get Russia in position, get the Temple Mount Institute in position... Get birds in position, fish in position, foxes in position. If he can get all these groups in position, what's going on with the church? There should be a radical expectation of doing the will of God. We should be praying in tongues more than we've ever prayed in tongues, hearing the word more than we've ever heard the word. It it should be so hot, our, our, our time with God, just radical, bold, wild. You know how you were when you first heard the truth. You got wild with it. All right, there's so much more. Let's go through a little bit more of it. Amazing. I mean, (laughs) one of the times I was on the Temple Mount, and it's really radical because we're going to get to signals for a minute, and then I won't keep you. I want you to come back tonight. I was in the Temple Mount area where the Garden of Gethsemane is. One year I was over there and had brought a tour with me. This is like 2000. Now, it's pretty radical. You're in the Garden of Gethsemane, and a lot of the olive trees are the same olive trees when Jesus was there. The Garden of Gethsemane's olive press. He had that pressure on his life because he was about to be separated from the Father. So it, the, what they would do with the olives is squeeze the olives and get the olive oil out. So that's what Gethsemane means. So I'm in the Garden of Gethsemane looking up at the Temple Mount. I'm kind of freaking out going, there's the Lord's address forever. It just kind of hits you like, okay, wait a minute. That's where you're going to live. You're going to sit on the throne of, your, of David. God's going to sit on a man's throne. Pretty crazy. So I'm just taking it all in. And the, the tour group I had brought, I came up with another tour group. Actually, it was Billy Brims. And she said, Joe, I want you to do a, a communion. I said, okay. 
and I forgot where the communion verses are. I'm standing there going, yikes, where are the communion verses? You know how you panic for a minute? There's a thousand people there waiting for you to communion. I'm like, I can't remember where the verses are. So I'm standing there for a minute, kind of walking around going, okay, where are the verses? Where are the verses? And I had an open vision. It's called discerning of spirits. I looked up over the Temple Mount and saw angels everywhere. And I knew it was the most active area of angels on the whole planet. I told Tom DeMott, he was here last year when I was preaching here. I think he's coming tonight with his mom. He's a buddy of mine from Salem Springs, Arkansas. He pastored in Heidelberg, Germany. I told Tom, I said, dude, I just had an open vision. I saw angels everywhere all over the Temple Mount. He goes, you better come back to earth. you got to do communion. <laughs> you know how your buddies keep you grounded? I said, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. So right, right then, Billy said uh, uh, there was an old prayer there on the Temple Mount named Phil Halverson. And uh, he had an open vision, looked up over the Temple Mount, saw angels everywhere. And I told Tom, I said, see, I'm not crazy. Now, see, what that is, is that's Jacob's ladder. We think it's some old rickety piece of wood. It's not some rickety piece of wood. There's a whole portal right there from Jerusalem. It means heavenly, it means earthly. This stuff is real. I wasn't there when Moses split the Red Sea, but I believe it. It's real. I wasn't there when Jesus raised Lazarus, but it's real. Absolutely real. You have tangible, physical things preaching to you how close you are to God coming to the planet. So how amazing that we're a part of this entrance of, of the king to the earth. Wow. Okay, there's tons of other signs, but I want to keep moving. I, men be lovers themselves. We have selfie sticks. People now don't just use one. They use two. How cool is that? I think I'll take a few more pictures of myself. They walk around, poof, like this. I was in Los Angeles last year. I almost saw a guy get hit by a car because he was so busy taking a photograph of himself. That's what the Bible said. Men will be lovers themselves. It doesn't get any weirder than that. I call it the Seinfeld generation. I've talked enough about me. You, you talk about me now. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on. So let's go to signals for a minute because there's some really radical signals because I want to get into this just before we go. So you've gone from signs, which there's many signs, about 50, to signals. Now what would the signals be? Signals would be the planets. Remember, the Bible says that the, the planets would be for signals. Actually, in the word there in the uh, King James is signs. But the Hebrew word is signals. Now, why is that a big deal? The Lord's just so merciful. He's doing everything he can to get our attention. Okay, so what did we have? We had blood red moons on Passover and Tabernacles a few years ago. That's pretty radical. I heard people say, well, nothing happened. They're not supposed to happen. They're indicators. Just like when you indicate with your blinker, you're going to turn. When you turn your blinker on, you're not turning. You're about to turn. So we had blood red moons on what? Passover tabernacles. Passover is when he died for us. Tabernacles is when the second coming is going to be. So the heavens are saying, I died for you, I'm coming back. I died for you, coming back. That's pretty radical. Okay, when's the last time you had four in a row? NASA called it a tetrad. When's the last time you had four blood, blood red moons in a row? Four in a row on Passover and Tabernacles. 1967 when Jerusalem was won back. 1948 when Israel's made a nation. 1492 at the Edict of Expulsion when the Jews were kicked out of Spain. So this is pretty radical. I told the Lord, I said, the gap between the last two were 19 years and 48 years. I said, Lord, you're just showing off now. So, so God's so sweet. You know, when you're on the freeway, you got signs telling you how close you are. Once you get into town, you don't need any signs anymore. you got traffic signals. So you got signals happening now showing us how close we are. Okay, after that, last year, you had the Bethlehem Star. This is pretty cool because you don't hear a lot of preaching on it. What happened when Jesus was born? We call it the Bethlehem Star. Remember the, the Magi rode by camel for 700 miles. Now, I know my buddies. If I had my buddies on a motorcycle ride, and I said, okay, we're going to get to Jerusalem, and all these stars are going to come together, my buddies would say, would say, it better be over the top. This is a pretty long ride. Can you imagine riding by camel 700 miles? You get to Jerusalem, there better be, there be some stars. <laughs> so, so what happened was you had Jupiter, king planet, Regulus, regal, king planet, Venus, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, a mother planet. All three of those planets came together at the birth of Jesus. It's called the Bethlehem star. And you know what happened when they came together. There they were. The constellation was Virgo. All right, last year, NBC Nightly News said, hey, we have a celestial event. We got Jupiter. We got Regulus. We got Venus. I'm like, man, that's the Bethlehem star. First time in 2,000 years. Constellation was Leo. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. So you got, you got uh, blood red moons. You got Bethlehem star. You had Mercury do a fly by the sun, does it five times in a century, went down directly over the Temple Mount at sundown. The planets formed a sickle, the moon formed a sickle. Orion changed his instrument to hammer. He had hammer and sickle on the same day. 
What, what, what's hammer and sickle? That's Russia's symbol. Why? Because Russia is going to come down against Israel. So God's trying to show them, you're about to go through the threshing floor is what it's called. God's getting ready to hang with me, put pressure on Israel for seven years. It's called the tribulation period. We think of it as judgment, but really some people are so hard-headed, they won't make a change until they have to. My dad didn't get saved until he had a stroke. Mock God, curse God his whole life. He has a stroke, gets saved. So there was so much uh, pressure going to be put on man for seven years to get them to make a decision. It's like fireworks. I said it last time I was here. In high school, I'd, I'd go out on dates with girls, and I'd pull over this one specific spot, and I'd get out of my car, and I'd shoot fireworks, fireworks off, and I'd come back in the car and go, you can't say you didn't go out with me and didn't see fireworks. <laughs> I didn't do it once. <laughs> I did it over and over again. So you're, you're watching the earth get ready for God to do fireworks. Blood red moons. Then you got, you got water turning to blood. You got asteroids. It's pretty radical. It's so that Jesus can present himself to his brethren just like Joseph did. So you're watching the earth get all these pieces ready for that seven-year period for God to deal with Israel. Wow. Well, you didn't have to deal with me. I'm already saved. So I don't have to be here. I have so much authority, I have to be taken off the earth so God can do things like he did in the Old Covenant because he gave the church all authority. All right, let me give you one more, one more signal. This one's really cool. Don't, everybody say, I'm not going to get mad at Joe. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger, okay? Let me, let me, give, you, let me give you these last signals because they're just, just crazy, okay? And really, it's about President Trump, so don't shoot, the, don't shoot the messenger. Okay, this last January, I was preaching down in Alabama, January 21st. It was Trump's midpoint of his presidency. And it was a blood moon, super moon, wolf moon on that day. Okay, when Trump was born, it was a blood red moon. Okay, hang with me. 700 days later, Israel was made a nation. When Trump was elected, Benjamin Netanyahu had been in office seven years, seven months, seven days. When Trump was inaugurated, he was 70 years old, seven months, seven days. Moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. How long? After 70 years. Now, we know the rapture is going to be on Feast of Trumpets. We know that. We'll get into that tonight, maybe. I mean, you got Jesus fulfilled Passover, then was buried on unleavened bread, then was raised on first fruits. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit poured out on Pentecost. So the rapture is going to be on Feast of Trumpets. That's the next feast to be fulfilled. I don't have time to preach on all that this morning, but there's about ten things about the Feast of Trumpets that shows us that's when the rapture will be. Well, you say our president and you say our vice president's name, you're saying the com- coming of the Lord. Trump and Pence, Trumpets. Could you imagine being on the planet when the president and vice president's name means the coming of the Lord? So, it's quiet this Presbyterian church. <laughs> Come on, hang with me. <laughs> no, those are signals for us. We should be going like, oh my God, this is crazy. This is crazy. Jesus is about to come back. When you say their names, you're saying the rapture of the church. Wow. Okay. Good night, everybody. Drive safely. Start the, start the car. I'll be right there. I mean, what, what are the odds? Well, that's just a coincidence. Really? You think so? No, it doesn't work like that. So, so you're, you're living on the planet when all this is happening. And really a compression of everything right here before we leave. The whole purpose of this, the whole purpose of finding out all these details, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Not mad at you, not frustrated with you, loves you. I tell the story, I'm, I'm closing right now. I was preaching in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Had a word of knowledge that someone uh, can't write. You know, I have weird words of knowledge. I was in Birmingham, saw a woman fly fishing, catch the hook in her eye. Saw a, a, a man get run over by a car. Saw a woman fall down some stairs. I saw a woman go through the front windshield of her car one time. I saw a man working out in the pulpwood fields, big pine tree. A cable was holding it. The, the tree swung around like this, and, and the cable broke. Hit this man. He fell over. That was in Birmingham. He was there. I said, there's a guy here. You got hit by a tree working out in the pulpwood field. This guy stood up, came down, and got healed. So I could tell you story after story after story. But in Mount Pleasant, I had that word that someone can't write and this uh, I just called it out because I preached too long on end time so I said you're healed after the service this guy comes walking up to me <laughs> uh, used to he had a little more time and now man you got too much stuff to get into but so this guy comes walking up to me he's like 30 years old and he's bawling I thought I said something to offend him he's boohooing like Aah! I thought well what is it buddy he goes I've never written before in my life 
He said, I have a disease, it's like, it's like dyslexia, but I can't write. He said, you call that out, that, that someone's never been able to write before. He said, I wrote a poem about the coming of the Lord. Never written before in his life. See, we, we just so underestimate how good he is. He's so good. His mercy endures forever. So with all of this info, what do we do? Accelerate. We consecrate, we dedicate to do the will of God. So let's do this. I want to give you a couple quick invitations before we go. But I want us to pray. Let's bow our heads for a minute. Lord, we thank you for all the tangible, physical signs of how close we are to your return. We're in awe that someone prayed for us and we're in church on Sunday morning. So we thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy. Thank you for blessing beyond church. Thank you for the assignments you've given this church, Lord. We thank you for this time of a renewal of assignments. We thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Real quick before we go, I know I preached a long time, but maybe, maybe you're here and you've never given your life to the Lord. You heard about this church, you can invite anybody and find out who they are in Christ. Maybe you're here, though, you've never taken that step to ask him into your heart. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I will pray with you. If you're here and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, just slip your hand up and say, that's me, and we'll all pray together. I know you heard about Pastor Nate's preaching, but uh, please, if you're a visitor, come back. Don't judge the church on traveling guy. <laughs> please. So maybe you're here and you've never done it. Real quick, before we go, with the uplifted hand, say, that's me. Pray for me. I'd like to give my life to the Lord. I sure don't want to miss anybody, anyone at all. Amen. Good for you, buddy. Cool. Anyone else? Anyone else? Oh, good for you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Good, good, good. Who else wants to give their life to the Lord? Don't want to miss anybody. How neat to get saved right before Jesus comes. Pretty neat. Anyone else at all? I won't, don't want to, I won't embarrass you. We'll just pray. Anyone else at all? Those two raise their hand. Anyone else? With the uplifted hand, say, that's me. Pray for me. I want to give my life to the Lord. Praise God. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Not mad at you. Just loves you. All right, real quick, let's do this prayer, and then we'll get another invitation in. Let's all pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I accept you this morning as my Lord, as my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. In Jesus' name, amen. How cool if you prayed that prayer and you believed it from your heart. Jesus said if you call on the name of the Lord, you'd be saved. Awesome. Congratulations. Happy birthday to those two that raised their hands. How cool is that? Live forever. Amen. Woo, give my hand. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. How cool. I believe you'll have a badge in your house in heaven. It'll show right when you got saved. You'll walk in and go, wow, pow, hit that thing with your hand. And you walk by it. Amen. One more invitation real quick before we go. Maybe you're born again, but you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. What we'll do in a moment is we'll close. And if you want to get filled with the Spirit, uh, Pastor Nate will have you come down and we'll pray with you. Anyone here, you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I got this in 1970. Maybe you're here and you've never done that. Jesus said you'd be endued with power, not weirdness. He said power. If you're like that here today and you want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, just with the uplifted hand, say, that's me. Pray for me. I'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Good for you. Awesome. Who else wants to join that lady? Good for you. Good for you. Who else? You grab your hair, I'll count you. Here we go. Amen. Awesome. Good for you. It's like an auctioneer. Five, five, 25, 35. <laughs> Who else? Who else? I think since I was here last, I was in Boise, Idaho. We had 30 filled one service, had another 30 the next service, had another 30 the next service. I was preaching in Orlando on a Wednesday night. Normally you have most people are filled on Wednesday night. 28 people got filled on a Wednesday night. So there's a whole new crop of people. I'm saying that. So if you haven't gotten filled, don't be embarrassed. We're all coming into this. Let's get all we can get. Who wants to join those two that raised their hand? Don't want to miss anybody. You want to be filled with the Spirit today. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's so cool about the Holy Ghost. He doesn't push you to do anything. He's gentle. He's kind. He's merciful. Amen. Praise God. I know this. The Lord wants to use every person in this room. He wants to utilize you. What an exciting time. What a great building you have. What a great campus you have. I love how you guys do things. So cool. I love it that you can invite anybody in and, and they can see how Jesus' thought pattern is. His mercy his kindness, and his goodness. Right here before we dismiss, let's lift our hands up and thank him. Father, we're, we're so thankful that Jesus gave his life for us. We're in awe that you let yourself be beaten. Right now, right before we dismiss, we take this moment to bless you, to magnify you, to glorify you. We love you, Jesus. We love you and we honor you. And we bless your name. 
Hallelujah. You know, if someone has damage in the lenses in your eyes, I'll just I'll let you know you're healed. Whatever was wrong with your lenses, just check it out. And what, uh, whatever was damaged, watch it restored in January of 2020. Amen. And we'll, we'll come back tonight. We'll get into the Word. And we'll see what direction the Lord wants to go. We'll be strengthened. We'll be encouraged. And, and I'm open for miracles. I, uh, uh, just because I preached on end time doesn't mean I've seen the greatest miracles preached on end times. Because <laughs> He loves you so much. Amen. Sure appreciate you coming. We'll come back tonight. Give Pastor Nate a big hand as he comes. Thanks, Pastor Nate. Sure great to be with you, buddy. Thank you.